Canary Islands. Sponsors the weather. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. It's time to debate the big issues of the day with me, Gloria De Piero, Patrick Christie's, who's standing in for Liam Halligan, and a whole host of experts and politicians. Yes, well, today, after the tragic loss of at least 27 migrants or people crossing the English Channel, we're asking could the deaths have been avoided? But first, start the news. Good afternoon, I'm Rosie Wright, and this is your news at two o'clock. The Home Secretary says there's no quick fix to the migrant crisis after 27 people died trying to cross the Channel yesterday. It's the worst incident of its kind in the Channel since the current migrant crisis began. Pretty Patel said her department had tackled 17 trafficking gangs and had offered to work further with France. Measures include putting British police officers on patrol along French beaches. I have literally, Madam Deputy Speaker, just spoken again with my French counterpart, Minister Dunman, and I've once again reached out and made my offer very clear to France in terms of joint France and UK cooperation, joint patrols to prevent these dangerous journeys from taking place. I've offered to work with France to put more officers on the ground and do absolutely whatever is necessary to secure the area so that vulnerable people do not risk their lives by getting into unseaworthy boats. The Defence Secretary says the future British Army, Army will be leaner but more productive. It includes having personnel deployed for longer time periods abroad in a new network of hubs in places like Oman and Kenya. Mr Wallace told MPs he expects the regular army to have 73,000 personnel by 2025. A new Ranger Regiment will also be formed to counter extremist organisations and hostile state threats. A 33-year-old man has appeared in court today in connection with the death of a couple in Somerset. Colin Reeves has been charged with the murders of Jennifer and Stephen Chappell. The couple were killed at home as their children slept upstairs on Sunday. A second man, aged 67, was arrested on suspicion of two murders and was released under investigation on Tuesday. One in six days out of the official bathing season were unswimmable last year because of pollution near beaches. It's according to a new report, and the campaign group Surfers Against Sewage found that more than 5,500 alerts of sewage being discharged into coastal waters were issued by water companies last year. Well, that marks an 87% increase on last year's figure.
Most men don't know any symptoms of prostate cancer, according to a new poll. A survey by YouGov found that 68% of men questioned didn't know a single symptom. It's the most common cancer among men, and symptoms include the need to urinate more frequently. Professor Carol Sakura told GB News it's important men face up to potential symptoms rather than ignoring it. There are nearly 50,000 new cases every year in Britain alone. So it is a very common disease. And as everybody's living longer now, and the average age of, of dying is over 80 now for, for men, then it's really important if you want to have that longevity to, to do something about any symptoms that arise rather than just hide away and say they don't exist. The government's expected to give the green light on proposals for English football's independent regulator. It was the key recommendation of the fan-led review that was commissioned in April after the European Super League row. Six English Premier League clubs formed part of the breakaway before pulling out of the plans after significant backlash. Well, the UK Sports Minister, Nigel Huddleston, has promised to move as quickly as possible to bring forward any legislation needed. First-time buyers face having to pay, on average, five and a half times their typical annual salary to get on the property ladder. A nationwide study has found it breaks the previous record in 2007 and it's significantly higher than the historical average of a house being 3.8 times your annual salary. Figures confirm that London continues to have the highest price-to-earnings ratio. And a Roman mosaic has been found in a farmer's field in Rutland. The artwork depicts the famous Battle of the Trojan War and it dates back to the 3rd or 4th century AD. It's one of only a handful of mosaics across Europe and because it's so rare, it's now going to receive special protection. You are right up to date here on GB News. I'll bring you the latest headlines in half an hour. But now, back to Gloria. Coming up on the show after the tragic deaths of at least 27 people who were attempting to come to the UK by crossing the channel, we're asking, could those deaths have been prevented? Yes, but it's not just our guests we want to hear from today. Join the debate with your view. Email gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. Welcome to the programme. We're talking today about the tragic deaths of dozens of people who drowned after attempting to cross the channel in an inflatable dinghy. It's been confirmed that five women and one child were among the 27 known to have drowned. Two people were rescued and four people smugglers have been arrested. Comes as an estimated 47,000 migrants have attempted the crossing since January the 1st. Yes, well, the pictures of French police watching a group of migrants carrying a dinghy to cross the channel have dominated today's front pages, prompting questions over whether the French authorities are doing enough to stop these crossings. Yesterday, Boris Johnson spoke out, saying the people traffickers were literally getting away with murder. Well, uh, GB News Home and Security Editor Mark White joins us now live from Dover. Thank you very much again, Mark. Look, you've been on uh, throughout the day, but what's the very latest, please, at the scene where you are? Well, I think the latest is really coming from uh, Parliament, actually, uh, where you are in London with the Home Secretary uh, addressing the Commons on the, the tragedy that unfolded in the Channel yesterday afternoon, saying that she is determined to redouble efforts to ensure that the people's smugglers uh, complicit in this criminal trade are brought to justice and that their model is smashed. And she has renewed this offer that uh, the Prime Minister also spoke about yesterday after that COBRA crisis cabinet meeting, that offer to French authorities uh, to, to give them border force agents, uh, other security staff from the UK, to be able to patrol the beaches of northwestern France to bolster the number of security personnel along those shorelines to try to stop these boats getting into the water in the first place because clearly we see it day after day on, in, on days when there are calm conditions, these boats pushing off one after another with very little, it seems, 
uh, if any attempts made by the French authorities to stop them. Now, the French would argue that's not the case, that they do stop migrant boats, that they stop them getting off the shore, and if they're close enough to shore, they do turn them around. But the, the statistics speak for themselves, and actually about three quarters of the boats uh, that try to leave French shores do make it uh, to the UK. So some real concern there from the UK authorities about whether France is fully committed to this fight uh, and that offer of extra personnel to go and man the beaches was rejected by the French government initially. Uh, they haven't said anything really in response to this renewed offer. Uh, I guess the ball is in their court. Uh, let's see what the French president has to say. Yes, it, indeed, Mark. And what had the crossing situation been like today? I think there was a, a, a thought, at least, after yesterday's incident, that you know, it might stem the flow of crossings, as it were. But I, I understand that earlier on today there were some more. Yeah, I mean, you might have thought that, uh, for a time at least, there would have been a pause in the number of migrants being pushed out on these small boats across the English Channel, but not a bit of it. Uh, first thing this morning, 4.15 a.m., in fact, the, the Border Force uh, Cutter Valiant came in here to Dover Harbour with 10 migrants on board that they had pulled off a small boat in the middle of the Channel. Then about an hour later, the Dover lifeboat arrived with 40 to 50 migrants that they had also taken from a small boat in the middle of the channel. Uh, there have been some other activity in the channel, but nothing that has come this way to Dover so far. But the trade continues, and whenever conditions improve, and they're pretty horrendous actually out in the channel at the moment because it's uh, a 20 knot wind at least which is whipping up the waves and making that very treacherous today so we weren't expecting much in the way of activity but the very fact that there is still activity given the conditions out there given what happened yesterday is very worrying indeed and we've been learning Gloria and Patrick a bit more about the boat that was involved in this tragedy yesterday, uh, described by the French uh, authorities as a flimsy inflatable boat. And that is right. We understand it was uh, an inflatable that has been manufactured in China. A number of them have been pushed across the channel in recent months, quite a few of them towed in here. Uh, and they are prone to, in the direct sunlight, popping uh, because they've got quite weak seams um, and they can't take much in the way of weight. Well, this boat yesterday had about 30 people on, uh, enough, of course, to uh, fracture the seams of this boat, it would seem, and uh, it started deflating before it got to the halfway point in the English Channel, that, in, you know, and obviously led to the very uh, tragic scenes that we saw with all those people thrown into the water uh, and either drowned or died of hypothermia before the medical services could get to them. Mark White, thank you so much. I know how hard you have worked over the last 30 or so hours. Um, you've been fantastic as ever on this really tragic story. Thank you, Mark. Yes, well, there you go. I mean, yeah, I mean, it has been absolutely deeply, deeply tragic, hasn't it? Of course it has. And joining us now to give his take on this is Conservative MP and Chair of the Defence Select Committee. It's Tobias Elwood. Thank you very much, Tobias for making the time for us. Priti Patel today has re reiterated that she's offered to work more with the French. She's offered more of our resources to the French government to try to stop the crossings happening. As yet, that seems to have fallen on deaf ears. What do you make of that? Yes, it's a very sombre mood in the chamber. I've just come from listening to Priti Patel, who was determined to want to work with our French partners to try and deal with this situation and prevent such a tragedy from unfolding again. I mean, from my perspective, there are three aspects, if I may, uh, on this particular challenge that we face. Firstly, the operational situation that we're just discussing, you know, what's happening on the French shores, what's happening in the Channel, how can we better co coordinate policing uh, with the, the French? Secondly, there's the criminal gangs that you touched on in that report there that extend right across Europe. They run complex networks, exploiting the desperation of migrants and helping them escort them across uh, the entire uh, Europe. And then finally, we have, I'm afraid, the, a big, the biggest issue, which is uh, the West has some responsibility because of the country's 
these people are running away from. These are failed states. Afghanistan, Libya, Somalia, Iraq, Syria. These are all countries that Britain and the West were involved with in the last 10 years. Governance and security is not in place. It had been filled uh, by extremists and other uh, tribal uh, factors, meaning that it's not surprising that thousands choose to turn their back on their home country and take the very risky journey to try and seek a better life on the continent, some coming to the, uh, to the channel wanting to get to Britain. Tobias, has the government failed uh, by not allowing sufficient safe routes for genuine asylum seekers to enter our country? I think we are failing. I think we're failing to uh, recognize the fact that we have abandoned these countries. You know, if you didn't get that flight out of Afghanistan, how do you then get to the UK if you have connections or part of your family are here? We have some processes in place, but they're very difficult uh, indeed. It isn't a, 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 an issue that we can um, actually uh, deal with alone. This must be an international approach, not just France, not just Britain, but the whole of Europe needs to look at this and say, we have a duty, a responsibility of care to these very countries, as I say, where we dared to wander into and then pulled out uh, with, uh, with the consequences now unfolding that uh, the, so they are so uh, risky, the risks that are taking place there, they're willing to you know, leave their country and come to the UK. Mm, indeed. It is, it is a, a monumentally tricky thing. One would have thought that an area where, uh, well, some people have been suggesting this anyway, is an area where we might be able to deploy our military would be to kind of cut the head off the snake when it comes to these gangs, these human trafficking gangs, these people dealing in life. You know, they're the new Pablo Escobars, aren't they? He dealt in something that could change your life, and he's at this, these people now are dealing in human life, aren't they? And is there not a way that maybe we could utilise some of our special forces, maybe our SAS, for example, find out who these, these, these top dogs are, as it were, when it comes to these human trafficking gangs and go and get them? I think that you make a, an absolutely valid point. I think that's something that must be done. Unfortunately, because there's a demand, I go back to this point, as long as there's a demand of people wanting to get uh, to, uh, to Europe, wanting to get to the United Kingdom, then uh, those gangs will be replaced by other organizations wishing to fill that gap, will fill uh, the demand, meet the demand uh, that people want to actually depart. That's why I'm saying we need to focus on what is actually happening um, in other parts of the of the world, if we actually and these, it's actually not difficult. This is part of what Global Britain should be all about. The other debate we've had today is with our armed forces, the advancement of what our, how our defence posture should be. We've become too risk averse. Yemen, for example, that should have been sorted out years ago, and yet it still rumbles on. And so more people depart from there. Iraq, we've not invested properly there. We've decided to turn our backs on Afghanistan. So the West is somewhat to blame. And I just simply make the point that you know what we've learned from COP26, um, you know our fragile planet. The turnaround to repair this is done in decades, and we've got to brace ourselves for some massive changes in our way of life because of crop failures leading to mass food shortages, lands becoming too hot to live in. We're going to see mass migration on biblical scales. We think we've got a challenge right now. It's going to get so much bigger. It was David Attenborough who said, "Make no mistake, climate change is the biggest." security threat that modern humans have ever faced. And this is just starting uh, you know, to get going this decade. Tobias Alwood, MP, Chair of the Defence Select Committee, we're very grateful for your time and thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Let's thank continue you. this conversation with our next guest joining us in the studio, his immigration lawyer, Harjap Bangal. Um, thank you for coming in. Oh, hello. The number of people to have claimed asylum in the UK after crossing the channel in boats reached 25,700 for this year. Mm. That's more than three times the roughly 8,500 total for all of 2020. Can they all be genuine? Mm -hmm. That's up to the Home Office to decide. Um, what's not in doubt is that, you know, they're, they're fleeing, they've got nowhere to go back to. Um, they've arranged or paid or been used by these gangs to get across here, and they need safety. They, their home, you know, is deemed not good enough for them to live in, and that they say they see UK or they see anywhere in Europe as a safer option for them to go. Mm, well, but some people might say, well, hang on a minute, you know, there's no war in France, is there? They may well have come through Germany or whatever. Why is it Britain? You know, do we still have that, 
that duty, that, that, that legal obligation? Well, we do if we want, we're signed up to uh, conventions and if we want to be seen as a leader in human rights, which we are, then of course we must um, you know, fulfil our obligations. However, we're not the only country to do this. Mm. Every other country does it. And they do take in a lot more than us. Yeah. That's now, a lot of, I've heard a lot of viewers, and I've read a lot of viewers say, well, hold on, there shouldn't be anyone coming in, they should all stay in France. Mm. Imagine if we or America had said that to the Jews. Mm. So how does a Jewish person, why didn't they stay all in France? Why didn't, in fact, why, Americans should say, why didn't you stay in the UK? Why did you have to tra go across, not a channel, an Atlantic Ocean? We can't be like that. We have to take on our proportion of what we should. So, sh you know, Germany should be moaning at us then, shouldn't they? They should be saying, well, hold on, you only take 1% and we're taking on millions. In fa the fact is... And the French take more than we do, is that correct? Yeah, the French take more than we do. In fact, forget the EU, the biggest countries who take on the most refugees are Pakistan and Colombia. And I bet your viewers didn't know that. Mm. And I, I don't hear them moaning. Mm. No, uh, OK, I, and I can understand that. Look, I've got to put this to you. Some people, no, go for it. Some people might say, well, of course you'd make that point. I imagine you do rather well out of... Increased immigration to the UK, don't you, as an immigration lawyer? Well, there's no legal aid for immigration anymore, yeah. so we don't make anything. Um, when an asylum seeker touches base in the UK, there's no involvement of a lawyer. The only time a lawyer is involved is when they get refused and an asylum seeker wants to challenge that decision. And is there legal aid then? Um, no, they pay privately. So, 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 yeah. so what happens if they can't pay? Then they have to represent themselves, as a lot, a lot of them do in the immigration courts. Mm. They represent them themselves. And the key is... 50% of appeals succeed. So the decision is wrong. The Home Office makes a wrong decision. That's because the staff's incompetent, the machinery of the Home Office is broken. We're told that by the MPs every year. We were told that yesterday, mm. that the Home Office can't even run a simple Windrush mm. compensation scheme. Yet your viewers want the Home Office to patrol the beaches in France and they want the Border Force to go and put the Navy in there and patrol our... Um, things and administer schemes run in Albania and Rwanda mm. when you can't even get a compensation scheme right. You're being promised something which cannot be delivered and you're living in that false hope. No matter what government comes in, this government's had 10 years and we've seen what's happening. Channel crossings are going up and yet Brexit was supposed to solve this and resolve this and it clearly hasn't. So who is it who hasn't delivered? It's not the fault of the asylum seeker. It's your MPs you need to question that why were we told this when you can't deliver this? And now we're being told today by Priti Patel, I saw it five minutes ago, so did your viewers, there's no quick fix to this. Mm. Hold on, three years ago you told us that this was all going to be fixed. No, nobody, whether they are sympathetic to us taking more refugees or less sympathetic, nobody wants people mm. risking their lives coming into this country in dinghies. Correct. Mm. What are the alternative routes to seeking asylum in this country? You have to touch base here. You have to put your foot onto land here in order to claim asylum. That's the one thing. Or be in United Kingdom's territories. Mm. The alternative is for us, and this is, what the, this is what the proposal is by many people, and people like Tobias as well, um, that a centre is opened on the coast of France where people can walk in, claim asylum, have their claim assessed, and therefore you will have, I'm not saying everyone will be stopped from crossing the channel, but people with families, mm. etc., will say, OK, well, let's claim asylum here. Some will be accepted, some will be refused, but they will not make these journeys because their case is under consideration. The other key factor is at these centres, everyone will be fingerprinted, mm. everyone's ID will be established and their case will be done. So we will know who they are as opposed yeah. to people without identities well, turning see. up on their coast. And that's a massive issue for a lot of people. And I can understand that. Some people say, hang on a minute, you know, if someone knocks on your front door yeah. that you've never met before, tells you whatever they tell you, would you let them in? Probably not, because it would be a personal security risk for your own property. Exactly. They could apply that out across the country as well. And, and some people draw their own conclusions from that. But actually, at the moment, what's happening now could pose security risk, couldn't it? Well, yeah, at the moment, and many people come in here, we don't know who they are. We have to establish who they are. Mm. When a migrant lands, say, at Dover, the first thing that happens is a screening interview. The purpose of that screening interview is to establish who you are, where you've come from, what your family members are, what route you've taken, how much you've paid to get here, and what's the purpose of getting here. Mm. Then they come to the substantive claim, which is when we interview them or they're interviewed about, right, What's your purpose of coming here? What threat have you got? Why can't you go back to your country? Why couldn't you stay in France? Then a decision is made. Now, to do that process 
of the interviewing and all of that, does, and a decision shouldn't take more than a week. Yet there are 60,000 claims that have been waiting for more than a year just to have a decision, just to have a yes or no about their claim in the Home Office system. We remember a few years ago, the Home Office, there was a warehouse found with just mm. files abandoned there, and there were active files, and they were just piled there. This is the system you've got, the Home Office, mm. the, uh, the structure isn't fit enough for what we're promising to do. But Priti Patel says that her new um, <coughs> plan for immigration will overhaul, I quote, our broken asylum system and address many of those long-standing pull fighters. She's been talking tough for two years on mm. this. Mm. She's introduced new legislation. Is, is she going to nail it this time? She's not going to nail it because it hasn't been done. I've been doing this for 20 years. My first job was to go and see 52 asylum seekers on New Year's Eve in 2000, in the year 2000. It's 2021 now. Same routes. They came from the same methods, same gangs that are doing it. We know where they come from. We know where they land. Britain doesn't have three million ports. It has a limited number of ports. We know where they come, Tilbury, Dover, mm. and all the same places that they come from, Portsmouth, Southampton, yeah. wherever. And we know where they come from. And so, but the gangs are always a step ahead. Coincidentally, now that um, this tragedy has happened, suddenly five gangs okay. have been arrested in court. Okay. Um, okay. Why couldn't they have been caught in the last 20 years? All right. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your insight. Of course, that immigration okay. lawyer... Harjap Bangal, just putting you through his take, anyway, on what's been going on. Well, we do want to hear your view on this. Could these deaths have been avoided? What should the authorities do to avoid future tragedies? Have you got any solutions of your own? Email gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. Up next, the huge challenge to build more gigafactories for the production of electric car batteries. We've got a report from Northumberland. Just before that, it's time for your weather. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello. This morning, the Met Office have named Storm Arwen. It's arriving through Friday and lingering into the weekends. Warnings have been issued, including amber warnings across parts of the northeast of England and eastern Scotland. The storm system has really yet to form, but it is drifting southwards over the next 24 hours. And the worst effects will be on Friday afternoon as the isobars squeeze together. Very strong winds across northern Scotland initially, but strong winds developing almost everywhere by the end of Friday. Back to this afternoon and, uh, well, for many, it's a fine day out there. Dry and sunny. There's a, a cold wind blowing, bringing a few showers across eastern England and a few for Pembrokeshire and Cornwall and some wintry showers in northern Scotland. But otherwise, largely dry and bright, but it is cold. Temperatures 5 to 8 degrees. Add on that wind and it feels even colder. It's through this evening we'll start to see the effects of the storm system arriving. Initially a band of rain pushing in with some snow over the hills across Scotland for a time. That zone of wet weather will then sink southwards during the night and become more extensive on Friday. Ahead of it with clear skies there will be a frost across the southeast, but quickly it'll cloud over on Friday uh, morning, making for a, a grey, cold, fairly damp day without breaks of rain for most places, but the rain turning increasingly to snow over the hills of Scotland. And then the winds really start to pick up on Friday afternoon across the far north with frequent uh, sleet and snow showers and the gusty winds strengthening further. Temperatures are a touch higher tomorrow, but it's still going to feel cold, especially as that wind picks up late in the day. Potential for damaging gusts of wind across the uh, north and east of Scotland, especially on Friday afternoon and evening. And then through the evening, the wind strengthened further over northeast England, but also across north and west Wales, northern Ireland and the west coast of Scotland. So Storm Arwen on the way, widespread gusts, disruption is possible. Keep up to date with the forecast. The warnings are on the Met Office website. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. 
Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Yes, hello everybody, welcome back. Next, the government's plan to move to zero emission road transport by 2035. Now, part of that plan is to build more gigafactories, which produce batteries for electric vehicles. But there's a huge challenge ahead. Our northeast of England reporter, Rachel Sweeney, has been looking at the real estate implications involved in helping the government meet net zero targets. We're hearing so much about gigafactories, companies from all over the world looking for sites in the UK. Now, we've talked extensively about the social and economic benefits of gigafactories, but we haven't talked about the real estate implications. Do we have what's needed to build here and whereabouts can we build? Well, according to Savills, the industrial property market is performing strongly. Land values have increased and land is hard to get. Kevin Moffat, who authored the research paper, looked into availability of land and other logistics like power and people. I asked him if he thinks the government's targets are realistic. Well, if you consider the implications around energy availability, if you consider the implications around uh, the planning system and how sites of this scale can get planning permission, um, these are all relatively time-consuming and expensive processes to go through. Um, so do we have the ability? I think in the long term, yes, we do. But actually, the, the need is, is present today. Um, so that is a constraining factor if we're looking to ramp up our production of, um, of uh, batteries in the more short to medium term. And, and what about the, um, the geography of it? So the northeast of England, which is my patch, has uh, will have gigafactories in Sunderland and Northumberland. Do we have the capacity to go further? Which areas did you identify that would be good for progression here? A couple of areas that we think are really interesting are, are the North East, as you've mentioned, but also South Wales. Um, these are areas that historically had uh, big manufacturing processes and they have brownfield sites available um, that already have a significant power supply. Um, they, uh, the land is potentially more affordable than other prime areas of the UK. Tesla opened two gigafactory sites, one in Nevada and one in Texas. After the sites were up and running, they said that there was huge demand for warehouse space in the surrounding areas. Savile says that this research is applicable to our markets over here in the UK. Well, I've been speaking to Peter Rolton, who is the UK CEO of British Vault, and he's in charge of building the UK's first ever gigafactory, which will be right here in Camus in Northumberland. Gigafactories themselves, it's almost a whole new aspect class now in the property market it's it, you know it's, it's the one subject that's sort of hot to trot really and everyone's talking about it um i think really for northumberland and for the northeast in general uh, we're well placed to, you know, to host uh, gigafactories 
Um, you know, land values is, is an issue. You know, land land in the southeast and the Midlands for employment, you're looking at getting on for a million pounds an, an acre before you even start. And when you've got a gigafactory, you know, they need sites 200, 250 acres. That's a big price ticket just to get going on the land. The, the, the other thing, of course, is, is this sort of post industrialization infrastructure. The Northeast had, you know, a lot of mining, uh, you know, coal, a lot of shipbuilding, you know, steel making. Um, these industries have gone, they left behind them a legacy of things like rail, port, and most importantly for gigafactories, large grid connections. And those grid connections are really also the key to getting one of these factories built. So um, the Northeast um, has a chance, I think, really to host more than one of these if it wishes to. And that reinvention is how the northeast of England has survived generations of change. We are resourceful. We've used our industrial heritage to create a sustainable future. Watch this space right here. Camus in Northumberland will be the UK's first ever gigafactory. The electric revolution starts right here. Yes, well, thank you very much, Rachel, for bringing us that report. And right, after this break, it's all about your opinion. So join the debate next on De Piero and Halligan, this time with Christie's. But first, it's the news headlines. I'm Rosie Wright. Let's get you up to date with the latest headlines. The Home Secretary says there's no quick fix to the migrant crisis after 27 people died trying to cross the Channel yesterday. It's the worst incident of its kind in the Channel since the current migrant crisis began. Priti Patel said her department had tackled 17 trafficking gangs and had offered to work further with France. All well, measures include putting British police officers on patrol along French beaches. The Defence Secretary says the future British Army will be leaner but more productive. It includes having personnel deployed for longer time periods abroad in a new network of hubs in places like Oman and Kenya. Ben Wallace told MPs he expects the regular army to have 73,000 personnel by 2025. A 34-year-old man has appeared in court today in connection with the death of a couple in Somerset. Colin Reeves has been charged with the murders of Jennifer and Stephen Chappell. The couple were killed at home as their children slept upstairs on Sunday. First-time buyers face having to pay, on average, five and a half times their typical annual salary to get on the property ladder. A nationwide study has found it breaks the previous record in 2007 and is significantly higher than the historical average of a house being 3.8 times your annual salary. Figures confirm that London continues to have the highest price-to-earnings ratio. You're up to date. I'll have a full briefing for you in half an hour. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8pm weekdays 
on GB News. Welcome back. We're continuing our discussion on the tragic deaths of at least 27 people who drowned yesterday attempting to cross the channel in an inflatable dinghy. Yes, well, the Home Secretary has, in the past couple of hours, made this statement in the House of Commons. Permission, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd like to make a statement about the tragic drownings that took place in the Channel yesterday. At least 27 people lost their lives. I know the whole House will join me in expressing our profound sorrow, and our thoughts are with the loved ones of those who have died and with those who responded to an extremely distressing event. Information is still being gathered about the situation in France as this becomes more and more clearer. The Prime Minister chaired an emergency COBRA meeting last night and then spoke to the President of France. I'm glad that President Macron indicated his determination to stop the vile people smuggling gangs and, importantly, to work, with, work closely with all partners across Europe. I have literally, Madam Deputy Speaker, just spoken again with my French counterpart, Minister Dunnerman, and I have once again reached out and made my offer very clear to France in terms of joint France and UK cooperation joint patrols to prevent these dangerous journeys from taking place. I have offered to work with France to put more officers on the ground and do absolutely whatever is necessary to secure the area so that vulnerable people do not risk their lives by getting into unseaworthy boats. Madam Deputy Speaker, there is a global immigration, illegal migration crisis. As I have stated many times, these journeys across the Channel are absolutely unnecessary. But I, as also, as I have been warning for two years, they are also lethally dangerous. Yes, well, Home Secretary Priti Patel talking there in the Commons. That was just a couple of hours ago. But joining us now is Laura Padone, the spokesperson for UNHCR. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us here. We're asking whether or not this particular incident in the channel could have been avoided. Do you think it could have been? How could it have been? Well, thank you very much for having me. And first of all, uh, I'd like to express on behalf of all of my college, colleagues at UNHCR a profound uh, sadness and shock um, at the loss of lives uh, in the channel yesterday. Um, this, this incident could have been avoided. Um, yes, uh, it's, it's a sad, uh, unfortunate fact, but people who are in desperate situations, who are vulnerable and who are in uh, being preyed upon by um, people smugglers often resort to very desperate and dangerous journeys in order to reach safety. And that's uh, sadly what we saw yesterday. Uh, people felt that they had no option but to put themselves uh, and their lives in danger uh, by getting on these unseaworthy uh, small dinghies to cross the channel to reach uh, the UK. And absolutely, that could have been avoided if safe legal routes to asylum are available. There are some safe legal routes to asylum, though. I mean, I printed off a press release uh, from August today from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, Afghanistan Safe Passage, joint, joint statement. There are some government schemes, perhaps not as many as you would like, but there does exist some means of getting here. Yes, that's right. And those schemes are very welcome. Um, the, the UK acted fast to evacuate people from Afghanistan when we saw uh, the fall of Kabul uh, in August this year. But unfortunately, the Afghan resettlement scheme hasn't yet begun uh, to resettle refugees from neighbouring countries like Iran and Pakistan. The UK did very well evacuating people uh, from a desperate situation uh, in Kabul at the time. But resettlement as it stands is only available to a very small, limited number of people, largely Syrians uh, who are in Egypt, uh, in Lebanon um, and in Jordan. So many of the people that we are seeing crossing the channel uh, don't have access to those safe legal routes because they're simply the wrong nationality. But that doesn't mean that they don't also have need of protection, that they aren't fleeing uh, conflict uh, and human rights abuses. And Often they want to get to the UK because they feel that this is a safe country for them uh, and this is where they can claim asylum and have those human rights respected.
OK, I actually went to, out to visit some refugee camps on the Syrian border and the Iraqi border as well, that border being with Turkey. And you know, I had a look first-hand there at the situation. There were lots of children there, for example, as well. And the overbearing message that I was getting from people there was that, really, they'd like to stay relatively close to their country so that, fingers crossed, everything sorts itself out, and then they can return. Obviously, you know, it's not looking like that's going to happen anytime soon. However, would it not necessarily be better for us, potentially, to invest in things like more refugee camps in places like Turkey, closer to home, as it were. Potentially might even be cheaper for us. 58 million quid, it looks like we might be throwing towards the French at some point. What we're having to do in the channel is costing us money with helicopters, etc., etc., etc. Putting boots on the ground in France would cost us a pretty penny as well. Is that an area that we could improve on? Setting up camps in places closer to the, where these people are actually coming from? Well, you're absolutely right, because the one thing that refugees tell me all over the world in all of the refugee camps I've visited is that they want to go home when it's safe to do so. Unfortunately, what we're seeing uh, in places like Syria, in Afghanistan, is that it's very difficult for people to go home quickly. The wars in these countries uh, go on for years, sometimes decades. So that often leaves people in a very precarious situation, living in refugee camps, um, which which are no places to bring up children, to have a life. You can't have citizenship, you can't have an education, you can't have employment. Refugee camps are a sticking plaster to a humanitarian emergency. They shouldn't be uh, places for people to live for extended uh, lengths of time. So we need to find a better solution. Certainly investing in the countries that are hosting the world's, uh, the majority of the world's refugees. And those are the countries, as you said, like Turkey, um, like Lebanon and Jordan, that are um, hosting the majority of refugees who have just crossed at one border. But if people then choose to move onwards and seek asylum in the UK because they have family links here, there are cultural ties here uh, because of a colonial legacy, then the UK should also uh, make asylum available for people who do want to get to the UK. At present, safe legal routes don't really exist for those people and we need to make them more accessible so that people aren't risking their lives. Yes, international aid really goes uh, some way towards solving um, some of the issues uh, that we're seeing. If we can invest in the countries that are on the front line of humanitarian emergencies, then that would be very welcome. And unfortunately, we've seen aid budgets uh, really slashed uh, in the last year or so. Laura, um some people say that the French are mm. letting gangs literally get away with murder by doing so little to prevent the crossings. Does that argument have legitimacy in your view? Well, I can't speak for uh, the French, unfortunately. Um, it, it would be hoped that the police and the authorities there are cracking down uh, on, on the smugglers. Um, absolutely, if there are uh, criminals who prey on vulnerable uh, refugee families, then they should be um, penalised and they, it should be uh, absolutely impossible for them to operate in these conditions. Every effort needs to be made uh, by the French authorities uh, working together with um, the British to crack down on those smuggling gangs uh, so that vulnerable people aren't put at risk. Yeah, OK. I, I mean, it's, 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 I was going to say it's a fascinating topic. It is a fascinating topic when you get stuck into the, the, the finer points of it, like what we were talking about there. Are there any alternatives that we could do, whether it's funding elsewhere or, or what the French are doing? But obviously, unfortunately, it's grounded, Laura, in uh, absolute devastation, isn't it? And hopefully, 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 this is a turning point. This is the catalyst for some form of change. But that was Laura Padone there, spokesperson. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Thank you very, very much. Well, let's speak with our next guest. It's former UKIP leader, Henry Bolton. Henry, thank you very much for joining us. Hi, Look, Patrick. we're asking Hi. overall, the overall question, could this have been avoided? Could this incident in the channel have been avoided? The loss of 27, at least 27 lives. What do you think? Uh, simple answer, Patrick. Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, why? Weren't they prevented? Well, let's come up with another simple answer at this stage, and that is lack of political will, lack of political courage, and frankly, incompetence on both the, the UK side of the channel and the French side. But what I liked about what I was just listening to what you were saying just now, and what I liked about that, Patrick, was your sort of point that actually, could we not do more at the point of origin, um, the, the, the point of origin of the migrants? And the answer is yes, of course we could. 
And in fact, there are three principles to sort of border management in terms of dimensions, as well as land, sea and air. Um, and those are international, regional, so in this case, Europe-wide, and national. Now, at the moment, the focus seems to be on, on our bilateral border with France. And we can maybe come back to that in a moment. But the, the fact is that if you want to manage your borders properly, you have to identify all the risks and the threats and the challenges to those borders, which generally emanate from outside, and they, they travel, such as migrants, such as weapons, such as narcotics, and so on. And if you, if you are not bothering, or you, you've simply not sort of thought about how you interdict, disrupt that movement all the way from the point of origin, even if it be the Far East, um, if you're not dealing with that at every opportunity along that route, then you are fundamentally failing in addressing the, fa the, the, the risk to your own borders. And of course, then that Europe wide. That Patel does not talk, want to secure talk, our borders. I don't talk, believe it. I, I, well, I actually, you well, know, I am not a, well, <laughs> I'm not a natural defender of Priti Patel, but it is absolutely clear that she is <laughs> trying to make that route unviable. And maybe it's just incredibly difficult, stroke impossible to do so. I, I'm going to disagree with you. I'm sorry. No, I please think, do. Uh, well, maybe she wants to. Uh, she wants to. Um, of course, you know, uh, uh, well, that's my working assumption. I, I certainly hope she wants to do that. But what, I, I mentioned the word incompetence earlier. We are in a country that does not have a cohesive, coherent border strategy. We've got, depending how you measure it, eight to 11 different government agencies, all with vessels in some way working on our maritime borders. There is no overarching framework for them. Um, there is no air, land and sea strategy. I wrote one of those for the Republic of Tajikistan, for the Republic of Kyrgyzstan, for Albania. I've helped 14 countries do this, and most of them are far poorer than us. But their borders are more effectively managed because they have a national strategy. We don't. What we have is, is we have a bunch of knee-jerk reactions coming out from the Home Office. Frankly, they don't know what they're doing. And that is the problem here. They are struggling to find solutions uh, in the Home Office. This is an all-of-government effort that's required here. Diplomatic effort, military effort, intelligence effort, policing effort, and I'm talking about police now, border force effort, maritime and coast guard agency effort. And if we've not got a coherent strategy overarching all of that, then frankly, we've got some major weaknesses there. And that's what I say, why I say there's not really any government effort going into this work. Why are we unable as well to stop the procurement and the distribution of these boats? I mean, look, at the end of the day, more boats than ever before of this nature have managed to find their way to that particular part of Calais. I mean, right. no boats, no crossings. Why are we unable to do that? The full, the full might of the European intelligence service can't stop a few dinghies being delivered. Well, first of all, Patrick, uh, you, you, very good point. Um, the fact is that uh, the, the European in intelligence services are not coherent. And if you take, for example, the Federal Republic of Germany, you have intelligence and policing at the, at the, at the, um, at the state level, and you also have it at the federal level. And often, the, the communication isn't very effective. And in fact, there's always been competition and a problem with leakage through the European Union to organized crime groups. And in fact, it, it applies to military security as well. So there is a leaking problem there in the European Union. Second thing to remember is that the European Union manages or is responsible for policy on its external borders. It's the European Union policy and failure that is allowing these people to enter the European Union in the first place. There are no internal borders in the European Union, so they travel to France. So when we're talking about French responsibility, let's think for a moment. France didn't let these people into the European Union, but the European Union has enabled free movement, which has enabled them to get to the North French coast. It's very difficult for France to deal with that. And in fact, they've got no lawful way of stopping these people getting on a dinghy on their, at their coast. The French argument is that it's up to us to stop them crossing into the UK and to reduce the motivation for doing so. And I think they have a point. That said, France, it could do more. Of course, put it in the, the whole context of of the, of the arguments over fishing and so on. But um, France could certainly do a lot more on this, even if it's just police officers trying through their own communication skills to persuade migrants not to embark on that journey. But they're not. They're not even doing that. So there's a whole layered uh, series of, of solutions here. Diplomatic, refugee camps, trying to address things at the point okay. of destination, corruption in other countries. But we also need to sort out our own borders, okay. to get some coherence there.
Henry, um, sort of an unrelated mm. question. Are you still involved with, with, with UKIP? Um, does that party have any, any future anymore? Uh, it is unrelated. Um, no, I, I'm not a member of UKIP. Um, no, I'm, I have I, dis I distanced myself entirely from that. Um, I, where I was trying to take UKIP um, back then was a very, very different direction to where it's gone now. I wanted a constructive party that could contribute to national politics and the whole discussion about all, what do we do with Brexit? What's our national vision? How do we actually put together a, a strategy and a plan for taking the country forward to making all communities in this country prosper uh, prosperous? secure and indeed confident. Um, that's not happened, unfortunately. They went off on a different tangent. I think the party at the moment is, is a non-entity. Uh, it could, with a very different um, national, uh, national executive committee's structure, uh, it could potentially come back as a phoenix. But frankly, I don't, I don't see that happening. I don't see that the NEC that's got this grip on that party and its own power plays in that party will ever relinquish it. So I think All it's right. dead in the water, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Henry. Great to have you on the show. Henry Bolton, OBE, no less, former UKIP leader, of course, now, as it sounds very much distant from that particular party. But you've been emailing us your opinion on our topic today, which was whether or not the sad death of 27, at least 27 people in the channel, could have been avoided. So we're going to read some of those out now. Noddy says anyone can see that the French are not doing anything to stop these tragedies from happening. Jeff has been on to us. France and Germany have twice the land mass than the UK. I think that's alluding to what was being said before about them taking a lot more uh, migrants than we have, I suppose. Stuart says Turkey and Jordan taking the most migrants in the world. The UK doesn't take in that many. Yeah, and uh, Alan's been on as well. Thank you very much, Alan. It appears to me the French are either incompetent or couldn't care less. Large inflatables are not invisible, so they must see these crafts en route to the coastal launching areas and do nothing about stopping them. Phil says refugee camps are only temporary. They are not a solution. People in them are fleeing countries where they don't agree with the political system. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that's, that's interesting, really, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's, that's one of the solutions that people are saying, which is that, you know, if we build more refugee camps. But I suppose until those countries are actually sorted out, they're not going to go back anyway, are they, really? But um, there we go. Well, thank you very much, everyone, who's been tuning in. And this has been my final day. I will no longer get to be Liam. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Smaller hands. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, oh, I'm sad not to be sat next to you anymore, but no, well. just, just, just the hands. <laughs> you, thank you for watching. Uh, up next, it is Darren McCaffrey. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello. This morning, the Met Office have named Storm Arwen. It's arriving through Friday and lingering into the weekends. Warnings have been issued, including amber warnings across parts of the northeast of England and eastern Scotland. The storm system has really yet to form, but it is drifting southwards over the next 24 hours. And the worst effects will be on Friday afternoon as the isobars squeeze together. Very strong winds across northern Scotland initially, but strong winds developing almost everywhere by the end of Friday. Back to this afternoon and, uh, well, for many, it's a fine day out there, dry and sunny. There's a, a cold wind blowing, bringing a few showers across eastern England and a few for Pembrokeshire and Cornwall and some wintry showers in northern Scotland. But otherwise, largely dry and bright, but it is cold. Temperatures 5 to 8 degrees add on that wind and it feels even colder. It's through this evening we'll start to see the effects of the storm system arriving. Initially, a band of rain pushing in with some snow over the hills across Scotland for a time. That zone of wet weather will then sink southwards during the night and become more extensive on Friday. Ahead of it, with clear skies, there will be a frost across the southeast, but quickly it'll cloud over on Friday uh, morning, making for a, a grey, cold, fairly damp day without breaks of rain for most places, but the rain turning increasingly to snow over the hills of Scotland. And then the winds really start to pick up on Friday afternoon across the far north with frequent uh, sleet and snow showers and the gusty winds strengthening further. Temperatures are a touch higher tomorrow, but it's still going to feel cold, especially as that wind picks up late in the day. Potential for damaging gusts of wind across the uh, north and east of Scotland, especially on Friday 